Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. In the city of Boston stands a statue erected in memory of a woman named Anne Hutchinson. It rises near the site of the old Massachusetts General Court, which banished Anne Hutchinson in the year 1637 for teaching that men may worship God according to the dictates of their consciences. That statue of Anne Hutchinson is a symbol of the religious freedom Americans fought for and finally won. And tonight, Cavalcade presents her story in a radio play written by Robert Tallman. Starring in the role of Anne Hutchinson is Agnes Moorhead of the Cavalcade Players. Our orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Agnes Moorhead as Anne Hutchinson on the Cavalcade of America. It's a winter's evening in the year 1636, the newly founded town of Boston in the colony of Massachusetts Bay. Ah, ah, greetings, good elders. Greetings, come in. You were uh, just going to start without you. Hi, John Winthrop. He's been going from Cambridge this night. Yeah, the season's upon us right enough. Uh, none too soon. Warm weather breeds heresies. Isn't that so, Brother Cotton? Uh, we shall see. Uh, good evening, Mr. Peters. Good evening. Gentlemen. Good evening. Pray be seated, gentlemen. It is time for the Lord's work to begin. It's good you came, Brother Cotton, for the matter at hand concerns you most particularly. But I know of no heresies in my congregation, Brother Peters. Brother Peters refers to Mistress Anne Hutchinson. Mistress Hutchinson? Come, Brother Cotton, Anne Hutchinson's activities can't have escaped your notice. And all the colony buzzes with talk of her. But all favorable talk, John Winthrop. She's mightily loved by the people. Just so. The devil in her that charms them. Are you quite sure of that, Winthrop? Well, let's not deceive ourselves, Brother Cotton. We're the ministers of God in this colony, but we're more than that. We're all the government there is in this new world. I fail to see what that has to do with Mistress Hutchinson. Mistress Hutchinson has achieved some fame for her good works, am I right? Indeed she has. She feeds the poor. She nurses the ill. Surely all very commendable. The state of the poor is God's punishment for their sins, Brother Cotton. But charity is part of God's mercy. Not Anne Hutchinson's charity. For with it she spreads a doctrine of free conscience. Such thinking makes this woman a heretic. And among the rabble can have only one result, a rebellion against our authority in this colony. If that be true, we must act. And act quickly. Precisely. There's only one way to deal with Mistress Hutchinson. Cast her out of the colony altogether. Banishment for a woman? It would be too cruel, Winthrop. You know what banishment means even for a man, Brother Winthrop. If it were summer, she might find her way to Rhode Island and join Roger Williams and his heretics. But in winter... It means I... death. But it's our stern duty in the eyes of God. Unless, of course, we can induce Mistress Hutchinson to repent of her crime. She has friends, Winthrop. Even Governor Vane of the colony. Harry Vane? We have the authority to banish him as well. Don't forget that. He was elected by the people. Don't forget that, Winthrop. When the people elect such men, they need guidance. The Lord's ministers are the rulers of this colony, Brother Cotton. This is only fitting. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Very well. We shall call on Mistress Hutchinson and give her a fair warning this very evening. <laughs> the elders of Massachusetts Bay. Open the door, I say. Who is it, please? The elders of the colony, child. Let us in and go fetch your mother. The, the elders of the colony? Child, do you 
not know the ministers of the gospel when you see them. I must say you don't look very godly. I mean, no more than anyone else. You see, brothers, her poison infects even her offspring. Tell me, lad, what does your mother say about the ministers of the gospel? Well, she says... Well, maybe you better ask mother. I'll go and fetch her. Go on, Edward. Answer Mr. Winthrop's question. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson. This is indeed an honor, gentlemen. No, no, wait, Edward. I want you to answer Mr. Winthrop's question. It's only polite. Well, Mother says, that is, she likes the preaching of Mr. Cotton and Mr. Wheelwright, but she says the rest of you are like, like the apostles before they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Well, gentlemen, being compared to the apostles at any time is something of a compliment now, isn't it? Gentlemen, pray do make yourselves comfortable. Edward, go and brew some tea for the ministers. Yes, Mother. Now then, where shall we begin our discourse, gentlemen? Mistress Hutchinson, it is the injunction of St. Paul that the women shall remain silent. Alas, that is true. But it is the injunction of Titus that the older women shall instruct the younger. And I try to do my duty in that respect. You have a glib tongue, Mistress Hutchinson, but that will not save you. Save me? From what? From banishment. Oh. Confess before the people that your teachings against the ministers are inspired by the evil. I teach nothing against the ministers, and even if I did... There can be no opposition to God's elect, Mistress Hutchinson. Don't you think God might have something to say in the matter? Mistress Hutchinson, you blaspheme. You said enough, gentlemen. There will be no more of these meetings of the women in your home, Mr. Hutchinson. For if there be any such, you will be banished into the wilderness. Is that understood? Yes, gentlemen. I'm beginning to understand a great many things. of Massachusetts Bay. I have asked you to this meeting on a matter of high import. And only faith may now save that which we have labored to preserve in this new world. What mean you, Mistress Hutchinson? That whatever our faith be, its pivot is one principal faith. The freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our consciences, without interference from any earthly power. Oh, but Mistress Hutchinson, the ministers call such talk by the name of heresy. It is their privilege to do so. Just as it is my privilege to say that I believe it not. But dare we flout the authority of the ministers? They do say that disobedience to them is a violation of the commandment. What commandment? To honor thy father and thy mother. We have but one father, God. And we may seek him as we see fit. I in my way, you in yours. And Mistress Dyer in hers, after the manner of the Quakers in a society of friends. God bless thee for those words, Anne Hutchinson. It is the first kind word I've heard in this community since... Since... Oh, Mistress Hutchinson. Speak out, Jane. What is it? They... They stoned me in the street. Yes, thee, Mistress Haynes, and thee, Mistress Ward. I saw thee among them. Is this true, good women? It is true, but we were distracted. Twas something possessed us, Mistress Hutchinson. There was a great crowd, and we followed. But twas no more than John Winthrop did urge us a meeting. Jane Dyer, you are free to talk as you will in this house. Rise and speak as the Spirit gives you to speak. Don't be afraid, Jane. You're among friends now. I... I'd just like to say... I... She's fainted. Get water, someone. Help me get the poor child to the bedroom. This time, perhaps. She was stricken for the heresy she was about to Hold speak. your tongue, woman. Help me loosen her garment. Why, she... Oh, Will some of you good women help me? No, no, we can't. Name it. This woman's a Quaker, Mistress Hutchinson. It would mean banishment. Priscilla, you will help me attend your sister. M me? Yes. The rest of you had better leave now. Fetch the kettle, Priscilla. And linen towels. Oh, it's all over. 
isn't it? Yes, Jane. It's all over. Try to rest. But the baby. Where's my baby? Jane, my dear, do you love the Lord in your heart? Oh, Anne, I do. I do. Then you can bear to hear. Oh. Your baby. Dear. Oh. It was better so, believe me, Jane. It wasn't a monster. Oh. Oh, and maybe Mr. Wentz had been the minister. They said I'd be punished for leaving the church for my husband's faith. And the people shouted, saying, the voice of God and not of a man. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Oh, they comforts my soul, Anne Hutchinson. Try to sleep a little now, my dear. I... For this night a great thing has happened in this new land. They that make the innocent to suffer are not to wield the power here. Not for long. So, gentlemen, as governor of the colony of Massachusetts Bay, I've called you here because I understand you have certain charges to make against Mistress Anne Hutchinson. Governor Vane, that woman has presumed to judge the elders of the church. I judge no man, Mr. Winthrop. For of a man's conscience, only God may judge. And is this then why the women of the colony no longer attend our meetings? That is their affair, Mr. Peters. Yet you presume upon our business. I do. I accuse you of betraying your trust and the principles upon which this colony was founded. And does Governor Vane accuse us the same? Mr. Winthrop, you and the other elders make up the tribunal of this colony. I was governed by your consent. And Mistress Hutchinson's as well, I gather. By hers, and that of the rest of the people of this colony. Then by heaven they shall rally to our banners in the common at the first opportunity. I am the stocks. We'll see about that. Will we? By whom? You? You will not put Mistress Hutchinson in the stocks as long as I'm Governor Hare. As I said, Governor, at the first opportunity, you won't be Governor forever. We'll see to that. <laughs> Brother Weems, Mistress Hutchinson is but a scapegoat of that scoundrel Winthrop. Beware how you speak of our new governor, brother. Uh, we live in dangerous times. Morning, citizens. Uh, morning. Morning. Do you know what's the other side of the common yet? Not yet. What's happening? Mistress Hutchinson's been put in the stocks. They say it is the most handsome spectacle. Uh, come, we'll walk over together. Uh, tell me, brother, what make you of this witchcraft, this heresy, this... Talk of freedom of conscience. Oh, it is the devil is in that woman right enough. Why, my good sister-in-law was quite distracted. She's been and seen visions, she said. Mistress Hutchinson was a saint, one of the sanctified of Joan of Arc. Oh, looky, brother. I see the stocks ahead. What a crowd. Uh, it is not often the daughter of an English clergyman has been seen in the stocks. Where's your precious freedom now, eh? Hey, speak up. Did you not arrive where you are through too much liberty? <laughs> Liberty! Yeah, perfect, you're great, Stop it, I say. Can you not even leave a fair lady in peace when she's helpless to defend herself? Thank you, Brother Weems. You have a stout heart. Aye. And I'm one as wants to see you victorious over yon windy tyrant. Speak out, Anne. Tell them our side of it. You'll never have so great an audience as now. Brother Weems, you're right. I will speak out. Citizens, listen to me. Look at me here like an animal in a trap. How long are you going to let Winthrop and the elders trample on the liberties you came here to secure for yourselves? Will you elect him to office again just because whoever happens to be against him is called a heretic? 
or will you be men at home as you were against the Indians? Citizens, assert yourselves. Make this new world a new world indeed. Aye, but how, ma'am? Yeah, the elders have the power. What can we do? There is one more powerful than the elders, King Charles. Petition the king to withdraw Winthrop and elect a governor of your own choice. Strike the first blow for freedom in America. Proclamation by the elders of the colony of Massachusetts Bay. This day, in the town of Boston, doth convene a court of justice, which will sit in trial and judgment of a grievous heresy. All are summoned who may bear witness for or against the Mistress Anne Hutchinson of Cambridge. Hear ye, hear ye. Court's in session. Mistress Hutchinson will stand in the dock. Elder Wilson, I should like to conduct the questioning of Mistress Hutchinson on behalf of the people of the colony. You may proceed, Governor. Thank you. Mistress Hutchinson, I accuse you of crimes against the people whose representative I am. Do the people accuse me, Governor Winthrop? Your glib evasions are of no account here. You have an evil spirit. Confess it and be exorcised. Good people, you answer me. Do you accuse me? The people will remain silent. Why? Why must the people remain silent? Are you afraid to let them speak? Mistress Hutchinson speaks wisely, Elder Wilson. By what authority does Governor Winthrop speak the people's mind? You will hold your impudent tongue, Mr. Coggeshall. May proceed, Governor Winthrop. It is easy to see how you do incite the people to seditious disorder, Mistress Hutchinson. Is it seditious disorder to beg permission to speak one's mind, Governor? I am conducting these questions, Mistress Hutchinson. We direct you to answer in an orderly fashion. Very well. Mistress Hutchinson, is it true that you did lure and beguile certain of the women of the colony to meet at your home in order to teach them a heresy? It is not. Is it not true that you did seek out the parish outcasts and deliver their souls to the devil as well? It is not. Is it not true that you did lure them with gifts of food which the Lord had denied them for their sins? It is not. Uh, Governor Winthrop, I must warn you against seeking to condemn the witness for acts of charity. I do not condemn the acts, sir. I seek to show that this woman used her good works to incite the people to rebellion. No, no, that's not true. Your conscience speaks at last, madam. You are fearful. Elder Wilson, I cannot submit to being questioned in this manner. You will proceed more quietly, Governor. Very well. Mr. Hutchinson, you confess that these people met at your house? The women met regularly at my house for prayer and discussion, as all do know. And what was discussed? Freedom of conscience, which I believe to be the basis of our liberties here. You convict yourself eloquently, madam. If the truth can convict me, it shall do so. The charges against me are not being made in the interests of religion, but for the suppression of freedom so that you, Governor Winthrop, may remain in power. I said so before, and I say so again to you direct. I must forbid any further such remarks in this court, Mistress Hutchinson. If you are finished, you may leave the dock. I do so with these words. I pray, God, the people will not suffer long under this tyranny. Thank you, Mr. Hutchinson. You have convicted yourself neatly, better than I could ever hope to do. The court will now hear the evidence of Prudence Ainsworth. Come forward, Mr. Ainsworth. What do you want me to say, Elder Wilson? Just tell the story you told Parson Peters. Well, one evening I passed Mistress Hutchinson coming across the common, and I distinctly saw a ball of fire floating above her head. When I reached home, I fell down on the floor in a dead faint. I'd seen a vision. It was the devil telling me to sign the petition against our governor. That will do, Mistress Ainsworth. 
Court will now hear Charity Stockton. Well, I was putting the children to bed when I heard a noise outside. I looked out, and there was a figure dressed all in white. I couldn't see the face very well, but I know then it must be Mistress Hutchinson up to her old tricks. The next morning, the children had come down with the smallpox. Elder Wilson, in the interests of fairness, perhaps there is someone who will testify in defense of Mistress Hutchinson. I will speak in her defense, Elder Wilson. Let him speak, Elder Wilson. Let him convict her as well. Elders, do you accept the testimony of these distracted women as evidence? I say that all that is on trial here is Mistress Hutchinson's idea of freedom. I say... You are out of order, sir. You will be silent. I will not be silent. I accuse you and Governor Winthrop of a conspiracy against our liberties. Silence! Hey, check that man! Now, Elder Wilson, I do give into your hands the fate of this prisoner. Then hearken to your judgment, Anne Hutchinson. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Church, I do not only pronounce you worthy to be cast out, but I do cast you out. And in the name of Christ, I do deliver you up to Satan, that you may learn no more to blaspheme, to seduce, and to lie. And I do account you from this time forth to be a heathen and a publican, and so to be held of all the brethren and sisters of this congregation and of others. Therefore, I command you in the name of Christ Jesus and of this church as a leper to withdraw yourself out of the congregation. Elder Wilson, may I speak? The court is now disposed to hear whatever the prisoner wishes to say. Then these are my last words. In this hour, the Lord has revealed himself to me sitting upon a throne of justice and prophecy. He has given me to know that generations will remember this moment as a bitter hour when tyrants sought to bring ruin and destruction to the freedom of the spirit. But men shall take warning and will have no fear. For I know that what is happening to me here and now, will stand for generations to come on this continent as a warning of the estate men may come to who are not vigilant of their liberties. You have driven me from this place, but know you this. The bounds of my exile are set in heaven, and I go in the name of the Lord and with his words. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Cavalcade of America thanks Agnes Moorhead and the Cavalcade players for their performance of the story of a great fighter for American religious freedom, Anne Hutchinson. She fought for the religious liberty we enjoy in our way of life. Today, we are called upon once more to maintain our democracy and its traditions, not only in its spiritual, but in its physical aspects. Therefore, one of the most vital aspects of our present defense effort is the conservation of our food supply, in which chemistry has assumed an indispensable role. DuPont brings you evidence of this in a story of chemistry at work in our world. In a time of national emergency, our food supply is our second line of defense. Every mouthful of food wasted becomes a matter of vital concern to the nation. Molds and bacteria are responsible for a food loss estimated at $100 million a year. Every housewife has had unpleasant experiences with mold. In summer particularly, its ugly threads, gray or green or black, appear suddenly and mysteriously on a loaf of bread. Then, though the bread may still be fresh, it must be thrown out, wasted. When you throw out a loaf of moldy bread, you may feel the waste is small, but multiply one loaf by a million families, and you realize that thousands of tons of precious wheat are wasted. 
Wasted, too, are tractor fuel used in cultivation, fertilizers, space and grain elevators, railroad transportation, all of the costs, all of the ingredients that enter into the finished loaf, all the labor that begins with the farmer and ends with the driver of the baker's delivery truck and the clerk in the grocery store. Mold is a plant, a living organism. Just as a weed is an unwanted plant in a garden, mold is an unwanted plant in the world of microorganisms. Under a microscope, you could see its seeds or spores scattering over the bread. Then why, if mold wastes so many food dollars that we need elsewhere, doesn't science do something about it? Chemists, we're proud to say, have done something about it. Nature produces a salt that has a marked effect in delaying the growth of mold. The salt is present in many foodstuffs, butter, milk, and cheese, for example, but in such small amounts that its effect on mold isn't very noticeable. Swiss cheese, however, is an exception. A Swiss cheese rarely molds because it contains almost 1% of this natural salt known as propionate. Why not make propionate salts chemically and add them to bakery products? That was the question chemists asked, and that was what they proceeded to do. Propionate salts were introduced by the DuPont Company under the trademark Mycoban. This summer, if you buy white or dark breads, cakes or pies from a baker who uses mycoban propionate salts, you'll find they remain mold-free much longer. And research is going on. Today, having solved the problem of mold in bread, DuPont chemists are experimenting with the use of mycoban as an inhibitor of mold in cakes, pies, soft and hard cheeses, jellies, tobacco, dried fruits, and beverages. Our food supply is important to us at any time. At a time like the present, it is doubly vital. Cutting down on food waste is one of the many achievements of the chemists who bring you better things for better living through chemistry. And now a word about our program next week. We're going to tell you the story of a man who, in his own words, earned a living the easiest way he knew how, because he admitted he was just plain lazy. So he figured writing short stories was a cinch. Well, for him it was, because that man was O. Henry. In a play on Cavalcade next week, we tell you his story, and playing the part of this beloved American writer will be Carl Swenson of the Cavalcade Players. And in our story of chemistry at work in our world, we bring you the latest news about DuPont's synthetic rubber, neoprene. We hope you'll join us at this same time next week when DuPont again presents the Cavalcade of America. At this time, may we remind you of the opportunity you have to enlist your dollars for defense by buying defense bonds or stamps at your bank or your post office. Let's prove our right to liberty by buying defense bonds or stamps for America. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>